Okay, I think we should be online now. Okay, yeah, it seems like we are online. Okay, so welcome everyone to today's five. Um, my name is Rindelani Makuya and I'm going to be the host for today. So I'm a PhD student working on the costs and benefits of solitary living in the Bush Kuru Red. And I work in the, at the University of the Witzwatersrand in South Africa. And today we'll be hearing a talk from Barbara. But before I we start with Barbara, I want to just thank, uh, if I can share my screen. Okay. So that's next week. So I wanna just thank last week's speaker, um, Joe Buck Holman, for his presentation. Um, and if people missed it and would like to, um, to catch up on it, you can also just go onto our YouTube page and you will find all the talks available there. And then for next week, we will have um, Lauren Brandt from the University of Exeter in the UK. And she will be giving a presentation on the benefits of social connections. So we are looking forward to that. And for this week, we have Barbara who will be giving a talk for us on the mass table. So this will be looking at the long road to our integrative understanding of communal breeding in house nice. So I've known Barbara um, just for a very short while, but she has, uh, I first met her when she first came to South Africa and uh, when she was there for um, a research position, not a research position, but sort of like an ex yeah, a research travel thing with the Stellenbosch University um, for steers. And she uh, was able to come visit us at the research station. I was able to spend some time with her. And her main research interests are on communal, um, I'll just stop this so I can read it properly so I don't mess it up. So her main research inter interests are on animal behavior and social evolution, as well as social behavior. Um, she also looks at the energetics and immunology of lactation, um, king recognition, conservation biology, as well as the um, animal welfare of lab and zoo animals. So she is a professor emeritus uh, who's currently retired, but worked at the University of Zurich in Switzerland, where she still has some association with them there. Um, she has supervised a lot of students, about 22 PhD students, um, and uh, 79 master's or diploma students, and also 11 um, um, postdocs. Um, and yeah, we're looking forward to hearing more. I don't want to talk too much. <laughs> Just let um, um, Barbara's work speak for herself. And yeah, welcome, Barbara, and we look forward to hearing your talk for today. Thank you very much, Lindelani, for this very kind introduction. And it's a great pleasure to see some faces, familiar faces, some I haven't seen for years. Hi, Alina, haven't seen you for years. And also old friends, and I oh. hope we can make new friends. So I now will share my screen so that we can... Start, can you all see? Yes, we can see it. It's okay? Good. So welcome everybody. I would like to take you to a rather long journey actually over the last 25 years uh, on our understanding of communal breeding. And I think it doesn't come as a surprise to us that conspecifics matter. We know that on a daily basis and we realize it even today. And also in many other animals, we got now or we have now published or people have published extremely interesting data on uh, how social interactions influence behavior and ultimately fitness. And I think this bias here on these pictures on mammalian studies, that's only my personal bias, but it does not reflect the literature. 
we know and we realize that the social environment an animal is exposed to is the most complex and fluctuating component of its environment. I think we haven't emphasized it for a long time, but we now certainly realize we have to rather integrate this aspect of the fluctuating, partly unpredictable and, compo and complex component of uh, social environment. And it's very important and it's very critical given that several of the theoretical concepts we refer to when we try to understand the evolution of social behavior, they rely on social interactions with conspecifics. And this is why I think this topic is very important. We assume that then, because of that, um, social interactions are selected to allow for adaptive plasticity. We assume that if the social environment is fluctuating, we assume that animals are able to respond to it and actually cope with it. And this is very important. As I mentioned, these basic concepts, one is of course, Hamilton's idea of inclusive fitness to understand cooperation, or I just briefly at the end will mention Mary Jane West Eberhardt's uh, concept of social selection and social partner choice. Community breeding organisms are, I think, very good study species to uh, test these basic ideas, how much is adaptive or how much of the social response to the environment might be adaptive uh, of these flexible responses. And community breeding organisms are species in which several or all members of a group breed and so to speak, communally raise their clutches or litters. We know these, this kind of behavior from invertebrates, from social spiders, for example. We know it from birds, from the groove built arnies shown here. And we know it, uh, this behavior from a couple of um, mammals. And we study communal breeding in house mice. Um, and what does it mean? It means that two, sometimes several females, pool their litters in one nest and afterwards indiscriminately care for and nurse their own offspring and other offspring. And here in this picture, you see a female who is simultaneously nursing her own pups. They are two days old, they are blind, they are naked, and pups of another female, they are already 13 days old, they are fur, the ears are open and they will open the eyes within the next day. Communal nursing has been described both for wild living house mice and for lab mice. And it occurs both in, let's say, captivity in, in breeding cages. It occurs in small enclosures and also in the field. And we got interested in communal nursing because lactation is very costly, specifically in small rodents. It's costly in most mammals, but specifically in small rodents. And so it's pretty puzzling. Why do females invest in other offspring in, instead of exclusively nurse their own? So what follows actually is what I call a mouse tail. It's a scientific mouse tail, and it's focusing on the reproductive behavior of female house mice, wild house mice, in case I forget to mention that uh, specifically. And um, so I hope it's not too disappointing that the males won't play a role today here. So decades ago, we started to tackle that question by asking about the fitness consequences of communal breeding. We did so, uh, we experimentally manipulated group size and specific aspects of the group composition of um, direct descendants of wild caught house mice under standardized conditions in the lab. And what I would like to briefly show here is the consequences of group size, specifically female group size on an individual's fitness. So I simply plotted here, the group size in terms of one female. Let me show, I should get that. Uh, yeah, hopefully you can see that, I don't know. But we can see here group sizes, either one female, two females or three females, and they are mated to one adult unrelated male and allowed to reproduce until they are half a year old. 
And we clearly intuitively see, if you look at the lifetime reproductive success, what it means, it's the number of offspring weaned within experimental lifespan of half a year that actually the social environment matters. So it has consequences in which environment a female lives, and this has consequences for her individual um, lifetime reproductive success. So the question was, why do females breed solitarily, given that if they have the opportunity to breed in groups, and I had forgotten to mention that if ever there were two or three females that reproduced at the same time, they exclusively nursed together. So why do they breed solitarily instead of improving their lifetime reproductive success by breeding communally? And maybe simply because they do not always have the opportunity to breed communally, which you might expect under more natural conditions. So we had to analyze the social and reproductive behavior of females under natural conditions in free living house mice, because so far there were no data available that gave us an idea on the proportion of litters raised communally versus solitarily. So in 2003, we set up a field study in a barn near Zurich, a population of free ranging house mice, and it's exposed, the population and the barn is exposed to natural fluctuation in seasons. And what we do inside, we structured uh, the environment here. So well, this means with this one, I cannot work the video, but I will have to go back. So I show you a little video from the population. It's structures with these dividers, but nevertheless, there are holes in the dividers so mice can go wherever they want. They can frequently roam everywhere. We provide bricks and things like shelters or so for the mice. They have food and water as much as they like. And we provide them with 40 nest boxes, as you can see here. And the most important or very important aspect is that mice are free to enter and leave the barn <clears throat> through holes, as you can see here, or under the roof. There are quite a lot of places <clears throat> from which the mice actually can leave or enter the barn. The nest boxes are very important for us. We can open them. We can look inside. Mice build very nice nests inside, as you can see in the upper left uh, part of the of these pictures. And we can probably shift to the laser pointer works better. We can check for litters, and when we find litters, we go get we go back at specific ages of these litters, and we take tiny ear samples for genetic analysis afterwards, and we take some kind of measurements. In addition. The entrances to the nest boxes are equipped with mouse detectors. They have been designed for us by FBI Science. It's no joke, but the company is actually called like that. And um, these are antennas that read the identity or the individual codes of these little RFID tags that we implant under the skin of all mice as soon as they reach um, 18 gram. And these detectors then allow continuous, actually, documentation of time spans, uh, time stamps, sorry, of mice entering boxes. And we can analyze afterwards which nest boxes an individual used and how much time it spent there and with whom it spent how much time in the same nest box. And these, what I call antenna data, data can be used for social network analysis. And Julian Evans, a former postdoc in our group, he used those antenna data. And here you see a network representation of social groups. It's based on sharing nest boxes. Each female uses typically more than one nest box and members belonging to the same social group, as you can see here, do not all the time stay all together, but nevertheless, they overlap in nest box use and of course meet everybody else of a social group, at least at some stage in one of these nest boxes. So females live in social groups with several female partners. And the interesting thing is that these social groups exist over long periods of time. They are rather stable. 
Here, Alexandre Beauvais and Julian Evans, they used dynamic community detection and over many months, over a year in the end, and colors, the same color refers to the same social group and followed over time. There is a lot of stability, but nevertheless, as you can see by these colored lines, there is occasional immigration or emigration of females and immigration into another group. Talking about the dynamics, it's quite important also to mention, is it really um, unpredictable, the social environment? At least there are a lot of um, unpredictabilities happen in the environment. The population is exposed to diseases, but I'm not going into details, but I just would like to mention another, what we call uh, catastrophic events that the mice once experienced because during one night, one, at least one cat managed to enter the barn population and the cats do what they're expected to do when they see house mice, they killed quite a lot of the mice once they entered the barn and about one third of the population was killed. And this was certainly an unpredictable catastrophic event. Julian used the opportunity to analyze actually the social structure before the event happened. The event is actually the occasion here underlined in red. So we see here the social structure before that event and afterwards. And it's quite interesting that you see there's a lot of resilience in social structure. Actually, the number of groups, some groups entirely disappeared, but the number of groups remained rather stable. Uh, nevertheless, again, without going into details, I would like to mention that um, Julian further was able to show that an individual's social behavior before the event actually had also an effect, effect on how this individual behaved afterwards, given that it survived, but this we could discuss that maybe afterwards. I mentioned before that we also collect genetic samples, little tissue samples, and these allow to analyze the pedigree and genetic relatedness among the mice and the population. And my collaborator over many years, Anna Lindholm, who's showing here, she uses that information to do lots of things, but this slide should remind me that we have pedigree information based on microsatellites over more than 20 generations for the entire barn. And together with um, Julian Evans, they actually used or combined that information on the social structure and on the relatedness among the females. Julian used multi-layer techniques to quantify this relationship between social associations and relatedness, both at the population level and within groups. And thick lines here in the slide that you can see are social inter or reflect social interactions meeting between individuals. Again, we see that we have these different social groups here. And then the color of the line, the more yellow it is, the more closely related are these individuals. The um, level you see here, it's not actually, not to be misunderstood, it's not Hamilton's R or Fisher's R in terms of, but it's a scaled uh, genetic similarity. But nevertheless, when it's yellow or the more yellow it is in contrast to blue, the more genetically similar are the individuals. And what we see here is that females live in extended family groups. They live together with related females, but also with unrelated females. Within groups, um, there is a pronounced or there is a rather high average degree of relatedness, but actually relatedness then is eroded because of occasional, as I mentioned before, immigration of other females into a group and also because of polyandrous mating of the females. Nevertheless, not all females are able to reproduce. Only about 50% of the females in our study population wean at least one pup. We don't know, we can only say something about the number of offspring weaned, 
um, but that's maybe because of methodological reasons. But nevertheless, if you don't wean offspring, uh, probably for your fitness, it's much more important to be able to have offspring weaned instead of just giving birth. So we see here that about 50% of the females never wean offspring. The record female wean 38 offspring within her entire lifespan. And this illustrates that there is pronounced competition among females over reproduction. And this is pretty um, similar to the plot that we get if we look at males, also about 50% of the males never sire offspring that survive to weaning age. But it's quite interesting that females compete obviously differently over reproduction than males do. Um, so I just plot here, uh, some information on uh, that indicate to us the strength of aggression within same sex adult individuals in the population on the left hand side, you see that the proportion of wounds open fresh wounds on males increases it's pretty high and it increases with increasing breeding activity in the population. So when there's high breeding activity signaling high potential for competition over reproduction, you see it actually on the back of the males because they have a lot of open wounds. Females generally have very few wounds and there's no significant effect at least uh, with breeding activity in the population. We assume, we don't really know, but from the literature, we assume that they compete or that how they compete, it's not over overt aggression, but over olfactory cues they emit um, in their urine. I plotted that data here because Esther Karlitz, another previous postdoc, she analyzes this data set and together with um, Hair samples we collect from the population. She also analyzes steroid hormones to better understand actually what's going on uh, or what's the physiology behind a, um, competition over reproduction in males and females. Nevertheless, those females that breed, they also breed not always, but they breed communally. We observe that 50 to 70% of the litters are nursed communally. Communal nursing or the proportion of litters that are nursed communally increases with population density, which is not very surprising. And um, how can we interpret that numbers or those numbers and this increase with population density could simply mean that the more options there are, the higher is the proportion. So communal nursing might be simply a byproduct of uh, sharing nest sites, as we've seen before. And Nicola Harrison, she got interested exactly in that question. And she asked whether communal breeding and communal nursing and use this equivalent because it's the same in house mice is a byproduct of sharing nesting sites. And she set up a null model of expectation to test female choice against random expectation. And random expectation is nothing else but the probability of a litter being randomly chosen according to the opportunities available in the social group. So we randomly would expect a female that shortly before she gives birth, nurses, communally with the same probability as the options available in the group. And these are the results. The dotted line, the black dotted line you see here is the random expectation and the red line are the observed data. And what we, at least to my surprise, I have to admit, observe is that females communally breed less often than expected. So this means they do not take any option that comes up or any opportunity that comes up. We looked at that result much deeper. We tried to understand what's going on here. And as a first step, Manuela Ferrari got interested in the life history and in the fitness of, on the one hand side, communally, on the other hand side, solitarily breeding females in the free living population. And uh, what she analyzed is, or what she found is that communal 
and solitary breeding are not fixed traits. Females switch between reproductive tactics. It of course makes sense. I mean, you never expect that communal breeding is a fixed trait because there might not be an option available. And we know that this sometimes actually is the case. But nevertheless, females switch between reproductive tactics. So it's quite interesting to look at this um, a little bit more in detail. And she did model selection as a first step to analyze the lifetime reproductive success of the females in the study population. And it does not come to very much to a surprise, I think, that we observed that lifespan had the strongest effect on female reproductive success on her number of offspring weaned during the entire time the female lived in the population. So the longer a female lives, the higher is her reproductive success. That's not terribly surprising. I guess we know that this is the case in many other mammals. However, quite surprisingly, and contrary to our predictions from our lab study, and that's quite an important point here, we observed that females had a lower um, lifetime reproductive success the more litters they raised, raised communally. So the more often a female raised a litter communally, the lower was her lifetime reproductive success. So entirely contrary to the lab studies, we observe here that communal nursing seems to reduce reproductive, or end up in a, in a reduced reproductive success in comparison to those that do not nurse communally. So communal and solitary litter breeding do not result in equal fitness consequences. And communal breeding seems to have fitness costs in the free living house mice, which we do not see to that extent in, in our lab studies. And what are these costs? Why are females less successful when they breed communally? What we observe is that, they, that pups that are raised communally suffer from higher mortality. They have a higher or lower survival. And what we know from lab studies, we can't observe that in the barn, but we assume that the same thing happens, what also happens in the lab. That is, that this is because of intra, what we call intra litter infanticide. So a highly pregnant female, shortly before she gives birth herself, kills some or several of the pups that are already present and afterwards joins that litter for communal breeding. This means from in terms of the behavior I just described that females can manipulate a group member into communal breeding by just joining that member and that the joint female risks being exploited. So there is a risk if another female from the same group joins you that you will be exploited because you suffer from this intralitter uh, mortality. After or at that stage, we knew we had to entirely turn around our initial question. We now had to ask why on earth do females breed communally, given that there are these costs, given that there is this risk of exploitation, why do they breed communally instead of staying solitarily? And interestingly, females decrease communal nursing with age. So the older and female got, the lower was the probability to raise a litter communally. So older females raise fewer litters communally, they are preferentially or more often, I'm not talking about preferences so far, more often nurse litters solitarily. And interestingly, also females increase weight with increasing age. So this means that older and presumably heavier females raised a higher proportion of their litters solitarily and gained the highest reproductive success. We concluded that communal and solitary breeding are condition-dependent alternative reproductive tactics. 
So females uh, or communal breeding in this sense is the best of a bad job reproductive tactic. And females that are not very competitive, they breed communally to improve their probability to reproduce when they are either of low body weight and or exposed to high reproductive competition. I'm not showing you these data in detail. They are published and we can discuss that a little bit later, but it actually is the case that communal breeding for non-competitive females or, com or females in a very competitive situation improve the probability to breed at all, even if they do have a lower reproductive success than females that breed solitarily. This actually let us talk about or think about um, what kind of decision rules might females make in the context of the social strategy, the reproductive tactic they choose? Do they actually choose specific situations or prefer specific situations um, when they are deciding between either breeding solitarily versus communally. So we asked, whom do they join for communal breeding? And we observed that females, those females that joined another group member, so this is an analysis only for those females that did join another partner when they gave birth, they preferred a partner that had a young litter, which is shown on the left side. So the younger the pups of the partner was, the higher is the probability that it was joined. And they preferred to join familiar partners. And we analyze familiarity here via the association time during the previous month before the communal or before the communal litter was set up. So females prefer familiar partners with a young litter. We also observed that within group relatedness is very important. When females lived among close relatives in a social group with a relatively high average relatedness among the females, then females opt for communal breeding. When we looked at whether the individual degree of relatedness matters whom they choose, we did not see an effect. So it's not that if they were had the choice between a full sister and a half sister or so, then that, that they went for the full sister. I don't find this, to be honest, not very surprising that we don't get that result, but we can discuss that afterwards. But uh, within group relatedness, very important. If you live in a highly related social environment, then you go for, you opt for communal breeding. So the um, decision rules the females make in the context of their reproductive tactics, they are very helpful to answer our question about the evolution of cooperation of uh, communal breeding. Um, they all actually reduce the probability of conflict or of being exploited by a partner. So if you prefer a related partner, of course, the costs, if you are exploited, are lower. So if you risk being exploited, rather be exploited by a related conspecific than by an unrelated one. Familiarity among partners might, and this has been shown in other species also, and I think we have some data on the lab, is, uh, gives information on what the other partner is doing, you know, how reliable maybe that partner is, how well you know. And preferring partners with young pups also lowers the probability, or we assume it lowers the probability that the partner discriminates against non offspring after uh, the setup of a communal nest. So they're all these decision rules seem to somehow um, help to explain cooperation by lowering the risk of exploitation and by increasing the stability of cooperation. So, so far we have seen that the social structure of free living house mice has some inherent properties that seem to, or might facilitate the evolution of cooperation through communal breeding. 
So the modularity in social structure I tried to show you promotes the stability of groups. They're very stable over a long time. And the genetic structuring interacting with relatives reduces the risk of exploitation together with the other aspects that we have seen. We recently went a step, step further. Julian Evan, Evans applied non-linear models to analyze the traits that might predict a female's breeding decision and the outcome. Um, important for the data that I show to you is that the data were only analyzed for females that had the option to join another females when they gave birth and that there had been an op option in the same group of another female joining maybe later on this female to communally breed. So what I mean is that we only analyzed here females in a situation in which they was the opportunity to decide between solitary versus communal breeding, both at the moment when the female gave birth and later on also that potentially this female could have been joined by another group member. And still, I found this very impressive. Um, this resulted in over 3,000 cases analyzed over um, a study period of the data included here cover 15 years. The original data look like what I plotted in the background. So you see these are uh, nonlinear models where we have a couple of uh, variants included. But today I would like to, to make the story a little bit uh, shorter and I just show you some major results that we get. First of all, there's quite a substantial number of females and you see these dots also are individual females. So there are over 100 females that started, that decided to breed solitary when they gave birth. And I would like to emphasize again, despite the fact that they had the option to join another female. And those females had a very high non-random probability not to be joined afterwards. Most of these females, over 80% of these females stayed solitary, although another group member could have potentially joined. And we see here the reproductive success of those females that were initial solitary, they had decided to stay solitary and they were not joined, they stayed solitary. The relatively few females of those that started solitary and were joined, and you see there are much, much less dots here. So it's just a small, these are about only, I think 12% of, uh, of the entire females that are plotted here. Uh, a smaller percentage of the females or relatively few females were joined after their initial decision to breed solitarily. And they ended up with a significantly lower reproductive success as those that remained solitary. We conclude from these data that females can determine how much they are involved in cooperation. Competitive females obviously can resist being joined for communal breeding by group members. That always was one of our missing links in the entire story. How can we show whether females can resist being joined? And I think here we now have the answer to that question. But what about those that had opted for communal breeding? I mean, when I saw this data, I thought, why don't all try? to start solitary, and then you might fail or so, but this is not the case. There's quite a substantial percentage of females, actually a larger number of females that initially start communal. They even don't try to stay solitary, but they join another female. And these are all these females where the graph here is uh, dotted with a dark gray color. And the interesting thing is, if a female joins another female when giving birth, her reproductive success is the same as for females that started solitary and were joined by somebody else, but didn't differ significantly 
whether the females afterwards were also joined or not. So in principle, this means that first of all, not all females are competitive to resist being joined. And although females can manipulate a partner into communal breeding by just joining them and imposing costs on them, the outcome is rather mutualistic and not exploitative. So they end up in a rather similar, they would have been better off by staying solitary. But if you go for the option of communal nursing, in the end, you have a rather mutualistic outcome between the partners that team up here. So the decision rules females apply when they are breeding communally seems to result in a rather mutualistic outcome. And I suggest that this stabilizes cooperation among non-competitive females. Although communal breeding is the best of a bad job, reproductive tactic, it improves the probability of weaning at least some offspring. And it, it is stabilized because of this mutualistic outcome. So the observation that female house mice are able to optimize their, optimizing inverted commas, to optimize their social behavior depending on the information they have on their social environment. That's a nice illustration, I feel, for social competence. And um, so this illustrates a lot about decision rules and the consequences or on the selection pressure that might have facilitated the evolution here of uh, cooperation. So the take home messages would be that decision rules for social partner choice minimize exploitation and result in mutualistic benefits. And adaptive plasticity in cooperation during communal, communal breeding allows to improve reproductive success under conditions of high intrasexual competition. So behavior that we had initially interpreted in a direction that actually proved wrong. We had thought that uh, communal nursing is a better thing to do than uh, solitary nursing. By analyzing it uh, over a large data set on a free living population proved to actually reveal quite complex, didn't look easier for us, or at least it took me quite a long time to understand what's going on. But nevertheless, once analyzed and understood in detail, they follow rather simple decision rules, uh, which we know from many other examples that what looks very complex at the beginning and the end, when you feel you understand what's going on, is follows rather simple rules. And personally, I don't think that we would have gained such insights by studying the behavior of wild house mice in the lab or in large enclosures. So we definitely needed that field study. And finally, I only want to thank all my collaborators over many, many years, participated to the mouse barn study over yeah, in the years 2003 until the end of 2020. And of course the funding agencies and many other collaborators whom I might not have mentioned explicitly here, but you only get such results, I think as a team in a collaborative effort. And I would like to thank all of you for listening and I'm very keen on discussing more details. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you, Papa, for such a wonderful trip down the mouse tail. And um, I think it was very informative. And um, I don't know, speak for everyone. <laughs> I don't want to speak for everyone, but I speak for myself to say that I really enjoyed it. So now we will take some questions. So if you have a question, please just type a question mark on the chat function, and then I will just call you up as your name appears. Um, yeah, and we'll just take it from there. So we already have a question from Ute. So before, when you, um, before you, you, you give your question, please just give a short introduction about who you are and um, what you're working on so that we can just get to know each other. Okay, thanks, Ute. Yes, hello. Uh, my name is Ute Rabespiel. I'm from the Institute of Zoology at the U University of Veterinary Medicine in Hanover. Thanks a lot, Barbara, for this wonderful talk. It really gave a very nice, uh, cohesive story at the end and much insights that 
one is often not getting together when one is only picking some papers from somewhere, but never having the full story. So it was very nice to see that. Um, but I, so I was wondering about the 50% of the non-breeding females and their kind of integration into this social network. And are they kind of joining these communal breeding nests or are they building the nests on their own or do they contribute anything or just pay some costs? And you mentioned that you are doing or have been doing these uh, hormonal studies as well. So are they cycling or are they not cycling? And uh, so is there even a, a higher cost or a higher competition level to those who breed communally but have a little bit of a reduced output or how does this fit together? Yeah, um, it's yeah. Thank you very much Uta, for, for this question. The we don't, we can't say that they are definitely non-breeding because we don't know whether they get pregnant or give birth because we can't, we don't see that this has methodological reasons. We don't uh, search nest boxes on an everyday daily, daily basis because we would disturb the mice too much. But we know from the hormonal analysis from hair that the progesterone level is high. They're definitely sexually mature and they're probably have also been pregnant occasionally. So their progesterone level is pretty high, the same level as the breeding ones. So what we seem to observe here is that not each female manages to maybe produce a litter that survives. Basically females are competing over nest boxes. These are safe places to be a litter. Those that try to breed in other places and shelters or so, the litters have a almost zero survival probability. We assume that the females cannot properly protect them against uh, neighboring social groups. And they're also, they also commit infanticide. And it's a good question whether, whether how, what do they do? Do they help or do they the opposite? Those that do not wean offspring, do they increase or decrease the reproductive success? The information we have so far is that females seem to need non-reproducing, not successfully reproducing females in the group to breed successfully. So with a rather large number of non-breeding females around, a female that can successfully defend a nest box, these competitive females have a higher probability to breed. This might have to do simply with defending the nest boxes, defending the territory. As I mentioned, they live and share several nest boxes and these non-successfully breeding ones might contribute and hope that at some stage maybe they take over. Um, we do not have any indication that they somehow help the breeding females. To the opposite, it looks a little bit that once females breed, we get in summer actually, which I haven't shown the data here, but it's published, they reduce the number of females they overlap with. So they somehow reduce the number of interacting partners. So it rather looks as if um, actually you need them for some kind of reason, but you don't want to have them directly in your nest box with your offspring. But otherwise, um, that's, uh, we, we cannot tell more about that anymore. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ute. So next we have Mar Marin Huck. Hello, my name is Marin Huck. I'm at Derby University. I think we met about yes. 20 years ago after German Primate Center Conference, a very posh restaurant for. Thank you. <laughs> um, so uh, my question is about the difference between the lab mice and the, the wild mice, because you said that the, for the lab mice, they, well, they, they, improve their reproductive success if they breed communally and that the wild mice, um, essentially the more competitive females that are heavier can choose not to breed communally. Now with a, a lab mouse, I would assume that on average they are in a better body condition, therefore potentially also quite well able to be more competitive in general. So why, why why do you have less 
um, growing others out of the communal nest a nest in the in the lab mice than in the the wild ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, first of all, they're all wild caught. I mean, in the lab, these were direct descendants of wild caught. So it's not that we used, and actually not with the very first experiments, but with experiments we did later, we tried to use mice from the same uh, source population as the barn so that we thought we have a similar genetic uh, background there. Coming back to your question, my short answer is because the social environment is so simple. Yeah, they just have one partner actually, and they seem to in the lab rather coordinate with that partner. And what I haven't told you with the initial data is that there's a strong effect of familiarity based on genetic relatedness. They know each other. They can two sisters, for example, and if they are symmetric in age and in developmental stage, they do agree and have this mutualistic outcome that in the end actually improves their individual reproductive success. So it's just they don't have any challenges uh, in terms of other uh, social partners or, or potential competitors around. And this seems, and as I mentioned, as I said before to Ute, they seem to be better off if you're not alone in a nest. And this is what we see actually when we keep them under these very simple social conditions with just having two females around in comparison to one. So two are better than one, but under natural conditions in the barn, it means you do not always have the same partner available. Because even if you decide for a specific alternative uh, reproductive strategy, it doesn't mean the same partner as you have joined during the previous term is also around. She might be dead in the meantime, or she might not be pregnant and being available as a social partner. So they see this additional aspect of complexity, which in the lab, I mean, they're constantly, they're often then mated postpartum. And so they're constantly sharing communal nursing with the same partner. And this is seems to be to end up in, a, in an egalitarian, mutualistic, beneficial situation, which we don't see in a free living population. I hope that answered a little bit your question. Yeah, thank you very much. We don't know about the mechanisms. I mean, that's probably what some of you might be interested in. What is it that makes a female competitive in comparison to others? Um, and I'm not quite sure whether somebody else will ask that question. But, um, and we cannot answer that from the data we have, and I will not be able to answer that, but from previous publications or recent publications from the group of Jane Hurst, we know that also females produce specific proteins in their urine, a little bit equivalent to what males do when they intrasexually compete with each other or try to be attractive for other males. And um, so females also differ in these major urinary proteins, and there might be some that actually signal their competitiveness. Yeah. Thanks, Maren. So next we have a question in YouTube. Yes, um, I will bring that question from YouTube. I'm Carsten Schradiner, co-organizer of Fine, and the question comes from Gabriela Morello. Um, who is at the University of Porto in Portugal. And she says, um, dear Dr. König, thank you for your talk. Have you seen anything regarding the preference of females regarding the size of the litter of the mate females or the pair female? For example, do females prefer mates, so partners with average sized litters versus small large litters? Um, they found, Gabriela found a higher probability of in trios of C55 BL6, so that's a strain of, of, of lab mice, to die if born in small and large litters as compared to average litter size. Mm -hmm. Very good question. First, in the barn, we don't know because we don't know litter size at birth. Very simple, we don't know that, so we can't answer it. We did, or a PhD student, Manuela Ferrari, in her PhD, she did experiments in the lab, and we did not, or she did not find an effect of litter size on the preference, because 
as suggested by the studies on the C57 Black 6 mice, and I know some of the popular, popular uh, publications from that group, you would predict that a female prefers a partner with a large litter because she can redistribute milk from her to her own offspring. So if she joins a large litter, the female actually produces more milk. The mother of the large litter produces more milk than a mother of a smaller litter. If she kills maybe one or two, she redistributes quite a lot of milk to her own offspring because once the communal nest is established, they produce milk according to the total number of pups and not according to own litter size. So you redistribute more. But in the lab, they don't go for litter size in the barn, we don't know. Thank you. Um, so next we have a question from Raga Bendra. Hi, thank you. I enjoyed listening to the whole story from the <laughs> beginning to the present. I knew only a little bit about the beginning. This is really very interesting that you you bring together the lab and the field studies. I have one, I need one clarification and I have a comment. The clarification is in one slide, you had females who began solitarily but, and either remained solitary or were joined. But then you also had females who began communally and were joined or not joined. What does began communally and not joined mean? I didn't understand that. This simply means the females joined another female when she gave birth. Mm -hmm. but there were partners in the social group who gave birth later, but did not join her. So there had been the option to be joined, but they were not joined. Oh. Yeah. yeah. So, my okay. yeah, okay. No, my comment simply is that I was fascinated by your condition dependent cooperation, because that's exactly what we found in the wasps. And we, we find that some females go off on their own and build solitary nests. And others, instead of going on, they join females who have already built a nest and be subordinate. And we asked, why do they do that? Mm -hmm. So we forced the joiners to become solitary and they did very poorly. So meaning each female knows whether I'm strong enough to be on my own. And of course, I'm lucky if somebody joins, but if nobody joins, I can still manage. Others know that I'm hopeless, so I better go and join and be subordinate from the beginning. So the wasps seem to know this just as, as the mice do. So I found that absolutely fascinating. Thank I, you. I, yeah, thank you very much. I, I would predict, and I think that Robalidia does the same as fantastic, because I think in many more of these species where you have this facultative, these alternatives between what we call joining or staying mm -hmm. solitary, I think you would probably observe similar things. So, so I think this is not so unusual just for house mice. But I also was puzzled, I mean, for me, the most puzzling thing was, why don't they always first try to stay solitary? You know, if there is the option to be solitary, there's an empty nest box uh, to say, why don't they just try? But no, they don't. And I think that's exactly once somebody would have analyzed the uh, mechanisms, I think we will fully understand. I mean, we are at the moment in a collaboration looking at the heritability. I mean, it's not yet published and the paper will not be submitted rather soon, but I think I don't tell a secret here. We look at the heritability of these two uh, tactics and there is a significant signal. It's low, but there is something. So there is some kind of heritable trait included, which makes it very interesting to see how it's stabilized, how does it keep uh, how is the variability kept in the population? But I also find it interesting. Some females inherently are not very good in being competitive. And then they, they even don't try to be solitary. They rather go for this communal option and at least they win some offspring. And this in the end should explain why we see both alternative reproductive uh, strategies. Yeah. In Dropolidia, we can feed some of them excessively and make them change their behavior. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, I'm not, I can't say that body weight um, does not play a role here between these strategies. But, I mean, they have food and water as much as they like, because that's normal for house mice. But we do not have individual information, of course, how much an individual feeds. I once tried to solve that technologically, but I have to admit I failed. I couldn't. <laughs> I couldn't get that going. We tried to attach antenna to feeding stations, 
but it was it was impossible. Mice tricked us out um, most of the time. But the wasps and, don't feed enough if you give them unlimited food. You have to give them unlimited food and force some food into their mouth. Then oh, they will really? them. yes, and then they will behavior. It's amazing. That's 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 quite amazing. Yeah, that's really amazing. And actually, the body weight data we have also does not allow for very detailed, fine tuned analysis. You know how much they put on weight or not during the previous time because the body weight data is rather opportunistic now. Yeah. Mm. But thank you. I mean, the comparison to the rubber Lydia is wonderful. <laughs> I like, I love that. Yeah. Okay, thanks, right. Um, next we have Catholic. Hello, uh, I'm a class 12 high school student from Bangalore, India. All right, uh, first of all, it was a really great talk. Thank you for that. Uh, I just have two questions. So the first question is that like, how does the division of labor occur within these communities? And how does that vary across communities with different degrees of relatedness, so to speak? And the second question is that how do these communities prevent inbreeding depression? Mm -hmm. First, great question. I don't know. We haven't analyzed that. And I think it, it is extremely interesting now to look at dependent on the intra-group relatedness or so whether we get more egalitarian <laughs> situations or outcome in those more closely related ones. We haven't looked at that, to be honest. Thank you very much for this um, question. And I think we will try to have a look. Um, the second question was, sorry, how the... No, I've forgotten. What what was the second question, Patrick? Can you please repeat that? It was uh, like, how do these communities uh, overcome uh, inbreeding depression? Oh, inbreeding depression. Okay. Yeah. Um, there is inbreeding in the population. Um, it's about dependent on the inbreeding co coefficient you take, but it's published. It's about 0.4, and that's the inbreeding coefficient. It, almost exactly the same that you observe in other wild free living populations of house mice. There are not too many in which inbreeding has been analyzed, but it seems to be that house mice, first of all, do house mice populations are characterized by some kind of inbreeding. And as we know from the fact that you can establish these lab strains quite easily. So I think if you start with 10 brother sister pairs in, in uh, mice, you end up with, I think, eight being able to survive. So house mice seem not to be extremely vulnerable towards inbreeding, but why isn't it increasing anymore? And I briefly mentioned is we have a very high degree of uh, polyandrous mating. So females mate with several males, also with males from neighboring groups and floating males. And also we do have female migration between groups, although they prefer to breed philopatrically, some females go to other groups. And the interesting thing is, if you compare breeding success of females that breed in their own group versus another group, there's no difference. The only difference we observe is if the mother is there. Females that start breeding in, their, in the group where they are born, when the mother is still present, they have an effect. And so that's the only one coming back to Uta's question, and I didn't mention it at that stage. The presence of the mother seems to improve breeding success. I don't think that it's actually the mother herself, but it's the stability of the social connections in the group. Because if your mother is still there, it means that the social group is rather stable. They might even inherit it. But um, otherwise, the short answer is they seem not to be very much affected by inbreeding and the level there on, uh, it seems not to be terribly high. At least we, it did not increase over the last years with a very high density. That's fascinating, thank you. Okay, thank you, Carl. So next we have Nancy Solomon. Hi, Barbara, really fascinating Thanks. hearing you put some of this together. Could you remind me um, about the about the biology of the individuals that commit infanticide? So um, is it 
typically females? Are they reproductive? Well. Yes. Uh, we observe, or there are two types of infanticide. One is a female, also male, that runs over or enters a nest with offspring that are definitely not their own because the males have not mated with the female that looks after the pups or the female never entered uh, that um, nest box, then they will try to kill. So that's the classical example of infanticide. So if you encounter offspring that definitely are not yours, they try to kill them. It's very difficult to say what's the percentage of infanticide going on in the barn. I think that this explains to us why it's very much very important to have several females around because they seem to defend the area. They might even sit outside. We observe them sitting outside of the entrance tubes to the nest boxes and try not to allow uh, non-group members to enter. And the second type of infanticide is this, what we call within litter, within communal litter infanticide committed by highly pregnant females. It also is observed in other species. And I think you also, of course, describe cases of that. So females that are highly pregnant, they often already team up with a partner. They go to the litter or to the nest, they lick the pups of the other female, they crouch over them, they might even give colostrum, we don't know. And shortly before they give birth, there seems to be a hormonal situation probably driven by prolactin and some other components. It's not, to my understanding, not very well known. But then they have a window, maybe one or two days before they give birth, when they kill, get aggressive, towards those pups that are already there. I observed that behavior in the lab. I don't know exactly, but I assume the same thing is going on in the barn. So the same females grabs a pup, starts licking it, and then licking gets stronger and stronger in the neck region. And typically they kill the offspring by neck bites. They don't entirely eat them. It's not that you feel they're just short of food or so. They killed them, and I saw actually in the lab that the other female, the mother of the pup, the pups scream. It's not nice to watch. And that the mother of the pups tries, in one case, try to pull off that pup, but uh, it made things even worse. So it seems that the mother cannot prevent it. And actually, a couple of hours later, this female that committed infanticide is again crouching over the pups that are there, licking them, and then gives birth, and then, you know, they look after all the pups in the nest as if there's no difference between own pups and other pups. I find this trigger in what triggers this maternal behavior to aggressive behavior and back to maternal behavior extremely interesting. But I never found there, I think in the group of Fred from Saal, they published a bit of information on what's going on, but I don't know whether somebody carefully looked at the mechanisms and the hormonal changes or the neurophysiological changes that are going on because it's it's if you watch it you almost can't believe it you know it's a matter of a couple of hours so then i think you indicated this so mothers with young pups are safe then to nest with because of they can't because. retreat so to speak they can't uh, fight back I mean, the point is, we always said, why doesn't the mother who suffered from infanticide now, why doesn't she actually kill some of the other females offspring? Because she is actually afterwards over investing into the offspring of the other female because they adjust milk production according to the total number of offspring, mm -hmm. not to, the, to their own litter size. So if the second female kills some of the pups already present, she re- um, distributes milk of the other female to her own offspring. So we always say, why don't they retaliate? Why don't the other, other female? I think the closer they are in age, you know, the higher would be the risk to kill your own offspring and then they don't do it. Once both have given birth, this kind of infanticide stops. And I think it, it just because you risk killing your own offspring. It's the cuckoo effect a little bit, even if they could, if they would be able to tell between own and non-offspring, you risk killing own, and that's not what you should do. Thank you. Thanks, Nancy. Now, next we have David. 
Hi, my name is David Wood. I'm a PhD student at Yale University. I'm working with Eduardo Fernandez Duque. I'm very interested in the decision making of these infanticidal future mothers. Uh, so it's very convenient that my question comes right on the heels of Nancy's. Um, I'm wondering if you can see any clear association between the number of pups that an infanticidal mother kills versus the number that she has or the distribution of pups across the mothers in the group and the relatedness between the infanticider and the, the victim mother. Mm -hmm. From lab studies, there's no effect. It seems to rather that they go for a rule of thumb in the barn, as I said before, we can't fine analyze that, unfortunately. But from the lab, where two actually PhD students had detailed data where we could look at that, there is no effect of own litter size on the probability to commit infanticide. There's no effect of litter size of the pups already there on the number of pups killed and also not in terms of relatedness. What we observe in the lab and also indirectly in the barn is that if females are unrelated, meaning they did not know each other before, then the breeding probability goes down. I mean, then actually they rather kill entire litters before they actually start and the probability to communally breed is much, much lower. And also an interesting effect is that uh, one PhD student, she was able to use a genetic tool where she could um, actually manipulate the symmetry versus asymmetry between litters. That was the only experiment we so far were able to do. And when females were asymmetric. And the good thing is uh, that we could predict who is going to have the larger and who is going to have the smaller litter. Then actually the probability or the propensity to communally nurse went down. It's not that we saw it in infanticide, but they reduced the probability to communally nurse. So once there was a strong asymmetry, it was about 50%. One had a litter that was only half as large as the other female. Then they avoided cooperation. But once both cooperated, we had no effect on litter size on you know, the number of pups killed or whether they killed or not. So I think it's more this initial decision that you try to avoid very asymmetric situations and we cannot look at that in the barn because we just don't know litter size at birth. We would love to, but we can't do that. But so once they go for communal nursing, then it's a very simple rule of thumb. You kill one or two and you redistribute milk. But in the end, they are rather mutualistic because otherwise you would expect that communal nursing would break down. If one is constantly explo exploiting the other one, then I would predict, no, uh, we shouldn't see communal nursing anymore. I hope that answers a little bit your question. So, but the... The topic probably you're, or the point you're pointing at is when you have a basic asymmetry between the females initially before they even, and then they don't like to cooperate. This seems to be the case, yeah. But it doesn't Very affect interesting. the interesting. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thanks, David. Um, next, we have a question from Carsten. Yes, hello. My name is Carsten Schradin. I'm um, studying mammalian social evolution at the CNRS in Strasbourg, doing field work in South Africa. And for you to know is that important to know is maybe that before I came to Strasbourg, I was working in the group of Barbara König, then on, on Stripe Mice, so she's actually my, my former boss. And I should know more about the project than, than I do. Um, First of all, I would really like to point out here, it's so amazing to see a project where somebody has um, data or lifetime reproductive success of, of hundreds or even thousands of females. This is really amazing, even if in some cases you don't know how much infanticide really happened, but I don't remember any other um, project that was presented here to find with such a huge amount, amount of data of lifetime reproductive success. Now, I'm still a bit confused with this kind of cooperation. And I mean, you must have said it several times this, this afternoon, but the mean reproductive success of, of communally breeding females is lower than of solitary breeding females. Is this 
mainly due as the solitaire breeders are the more, most competitive, or is it because there's a cost of communal breeding, in which case, if one goes by the definition that cooperation is plus plus, both benefit, it would not be really cooperation. Uh, maybe I start from the back, Carsten. I mean, if I use if I use the term cooperation, I simply mean two individuals are doing something together, and I do not refer to costs or benefits. I find it sometimes confusing uh, if people define cooperation already through saying this means it's to the benefit of whoever you know the one showing it. I use cooperation simply as a descriptive term. And then by analyzing the costs and benefits, I then feel I then make um, actually conclusions about what is it? You know, do we have a mutualistic behavior? Do we, we have an exploitative behavior or what is it? So in this, I mean, that's how I use the term cooperation. But coming back to your question, um, it's uh, probably it's both actually is included. We seem to have variability between females in the free living population. Something has to actually to, to select for this variability in competitiveness. We don't understand, and I will not be able to do it from our data set. Others will have to look at maybe at the mechanisms and then be able to tell why are not all females, why do females differ in their competitiveness as Akaventa also has described it, obviously for Ropalidia females. There seems to be variability between females and this affects their reproductive strategy or tactic. You know, it's not really a strategy. The strategy is you can do both. And then what I do is depends on my own competitiveness. In addition, when you go for communal nursing, you have the potential for exploitation. I think there is conflict between these females. I'm pretty sure there is quite a lot of conflict, but they seem to be able to solve that conflict in a way that it pays to go for it because you're better off in comparison to not trying it at all because then you have zero reproductive success. But if you solve that conflict, at least you have some reproductive success, even as a competitive female, you have a higher one. And this is why I was not terribly surprised, although um, we are still at the beginning to work on that, that there is some kind of signal for heritability. You know, there must be selection on this, this mutualistic outcome when they decide for communal nursing seems to me the most fascinating part. How do they avoid actually exploiting somebody else or being exploited by somebody? So they somehow then come up, at least in the end, they come up with the same reproductive success, yeah. But the infanticide is for me this expression of, I mean, there's always conflict over reproduction if you're not genetically identical. And first of all, they compete over who is able to defend a nest box alone. If you're not able to do that, you still express your uh, conflict by manipulating litter sizes of other females. We don't know whether these solitarily breeding females commit infanticide towards others. We just don't know. They might try, but maybe, you know, it's too costly to always go into other nest, nests. And then this means your own nest is unprotected or so. I don't know. Okay, thank you. Uh, just one follow-up question. I mean, I, I had the feeling that these data from community breeding females might, might be at least two different, different kinds, which one cannot disintegrate. But this huge amount of females will never breed. Can you make a statement whether all of them would be communal breeders if they would, for whatever reason, breed? Or does this also include lots of them that would be solitary? I mean, because if there would be lots of females with the, the heritable um, preposition right. to breed solitarily that have zero, that would um, change the entire um, picture of what is the mean reproductive success of these two yep. techniques. I can't predict. We might be able, once we better understand um, what traits are involved. I mean, the aim is a little bit in collaboration with Columbia University, with Andres Bendeski, 
we actually uh, look at this, first of all, the heritability aspect, and also in terms of whether we find some kind of traits that correlate with competitiveness. And once we know that, we can look at the non-breeding ones because we have that genetic information. I think the non-breeding ones are a bit more complicated because it probably depends on how many females are already in the social group and that are breeding. And given that females have a rather low life expectancy, on average, some females get pretty old, but on average, a female has less than two litters of the, of the breeding females. And on average, life expectancy is about 180 days. So many of those that never weaned offspring might have just died, although they were competitive enough uh, principally to breed solitarily. We can't, at the, at the moment, I can't say anything about that. Maybe in the future, it's possible to look at those and look at in how they differ in specific traits from those that breed. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Kasten. Um, so next we have Asan. Yeah, hello. I am Asier from the Basque Country University in Spain. I am also in the Vetemeduni in Austria studying dogs and wolves. Mm -hmm. And I studied uh, mice in the past. And my mm -hmm. question is, um, okay, the, the females that breed uh, alone have more fitness, but have you studied if there is a selective pressure at the group level so that the groups with more females uh, breed co-breeding uh, have more chance to to grow than groups where there is no so much co-breeding very good question i don't know but i can use something we never looked at that but i can tell you another effect I mentioned that with increasing population density, the proportion of communally breeding females or litters that are raised communally increases. The interesting thing is that this increases population size. They are constantly, I mean, I have to admit after 10 years or 12 years, we thought the population was still, we thought now they must level off. I mean, it can't be that even more mice live in the barn. They constantly grew. And this means communal nursing, cooperation through communal nursing allows for population growth, even under increasing competitive uh, conditions. Why might that be interesting? You might have heard in the about two years ago, there were, it was going through the press again. There are populations in Australia, house mouse, free living house mouse populations in Australia. And they are known to actually go through these outbreaks. Sometimes you have outbreaks of house mice and you have literally a farmer is opening the door of a barn and there's a tapestry of mice coming out. And I also have a video after Australia was hit by the fires first and then afterwards by flooding, they described a lot of outbreaks of mice after food was available again. And we assume, and I had discussed that with Charles Krebs, and he was really excited by that, that probably this communal nursing allows for these outbreaks. Under specific conditions, they still, populations grow, although competition increases, but because they com can communally nurse under these uh, conditions, it allows for population growth and probably these outbreaks. I mean, it's a bit of a, a very specu yeah, a huge speculation what I'm saying here, but um, we began to look at some, some simulations together with Madan Oli, those people who are very good in these demographic data, and it might explain these effects, actually. So it's quite interesting that cooperation in the end can lead to population growth under very competitive conditions. Although individually, you would be better off uh, nursing solitarily. Yeah, but the result on the population level is an outbreak. Thank you very it much. Makes, it makes us think a little bit about humans, isn't it? <laughs> we might. I mean, of course, that, that's really speculative, but it that, you know, it. It allows to, to grow, populations can grow despite actually individually, it's not the best you, you could do, yeah. Hmm. Thanks, thanks so much.
Hey, thanks, Asan. So before I come to my question, I'll let Zulema ask her question. Yes, hi. Oh, <clears throat> Zulema Tain Martinez from the University of Missouri in St. Louis uh, in the US and I'm retired. And the question I have, and, and I think I came in, I had to come in a little bit late, so I might have missed this, but how, do we have any idea how common infanticide by pregnant females is? And also do females ever join without killing any pups? And on the flip side, if all the pups are killed in a litter, then does the victim leave or is she somehow co-opted into staying and still helping to uh, take care of the, the, uh, the pups from the infanticidal female? Yeah, thank you. Um, I start from the last question because it helps to explain your first ones. Um, in the lab, it happens sometimes that one of the partners died when both actually had litters and then the other try to wean or to bring, they reduce the total litter size because they could not produce enough milk, let's say for 10, 12 pups in the communal nest, but they try to bring them through. If a female killed, as you suggested, Oya, that you asked for all the offspring, which happened occasionally, rarely, all the offspring of the other female, then we had situations that the other female did not continue, did not uh, look after the litter anymore. This for me is a little bit the, uh, the idea why don't they always kill all of the other females pups because this would be the best because if you could redistribute the milk, it would be total exploitation, wouldn't it? But this is not what we observe. And I think they seem to have mechanisms which prevents this extreme case of exploitation. We do observe females that never kill, yes. We do, or uh, uh, otherwise, principally, I would guess, I have to look it up from the lab, over 80% of the females do it. So it's quite a, let's say, a regular behavior component of their behavior if they are in the situation. So it seems to be something that's somehow built in, 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 in female house mice. And I think it's not only in female house mice, I think it's in many other species too, that there is this propensity for infanticide in very specific situations. So, but the regulation of that behavior fascinates me, although I don't understand it. I mean, it would be lovely to <laughs> better analyze it. Yeah, I, it's a fascinating talk. And I guess I had another question and now I, I'm trying to remind myself of what it was. That's okay. If I think of it, you have time. I'll come back and ask again. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Zalema. Um, so we also have a question from Francine. Sorry, I missed it. It was a bit lost in the chat. Uh, yes. So thank you. I, I wrote it in the chat, but I'll also ask it. Thank you for an oh. interesting presentation. It's been just the discussion as well and all of the questions. Um, so in tamarins, when they, they cooperatively breed, the young, the subadults and the young adults who are not breeding individuals will learn at the nest how to take care of their siblings. Mm -hmm. And those individuals, if they don't have that experience, when they go off to breed, then they're not good parents. Um, and their initial offspring usually don't, don't survive. So I'm just wondering if the younger um, house mice, when they work, when they get together communally to take care of each other, if that's done because this is a learning experience for them to become better parents, become better mothers. And I know that's going to be a really hard question to answer. I mean, in, in real life, but also just, you know, you have to speculate, but I'm just curious what you thought about it. So yeah. thank you. No, thank you very much. I mean, we did an experiment in the lab with wild house mice where we allowed females Two experiments first to stay with the mother when she was rearing the next litter and to see whether this experience improved their own breeding success af af afterwards in comparison to females that were removed from the group before the next litter was born. There was no effect. We also looked at um, the 
whether females that stayed with their mother and the next litter was born or so, and afterwards we introduced when the daughter sexually matured in the presence of the mother, we introduced another unfamiliar male in comparison to two sisters where, that have not had that experience with the mother and also did not see an effect. So we, uh, my understanding is a little bit that Given the life history of house mice and the rather short life expectancy, there's not such a lot of uh, social learning. I mean, under very standardized situation in the lab, you might see differences between early social environment and what happens later. And I'm not saying that there is no effect, but I think there are so many other situations or the, the social environment in the free living population actually there's not a lot of selection pressure or fine tuning that because they are just too short lived. The probabilities of having still a sister available when you start breeding and also for, for the females with the mother present, then our sample sizes go down quite rap rapidly. We do still have a couple of hundred. I mean, postdocs always say, oh, I only have 300 females in that situation. <laughs> and you start with 3,000 or something like that. And um, so that doesn't seem to be an effect, to be honest, at least not a strong effect that we can get out as a signal if we include an, all the other variables. So. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. In primates also, I, I, I guess there's much more opportunity for social learning in comparison to house mice, yeah. Thanks, Francine. And so we now have another question from Marin. Okay, so when you talked about these explosive outbreaks of mice in Australia and wherever, maybe you think again about these catastrophic events where, that you could witness. So my question, you won't be able to answer it. You can just speculate because ethically you can't really make catastrophic events a regular thing. So you can't just have a cat in the barn living there. But what do you think would change or, or would mice adapt to how frequent these events are? So in normal life, of course, you have cats and other predators around regularly. In the barn, obviously, it's only if a cat is clever enough to come in or if there's a hole where, I don't know, a weasel could come in or I don't know, but it's probably nothing particularly regularly. Uh, so, would the would the mice have different tactics depending on the frequency of predation, for example, or disease outbreak? Mm -hmm. Yeah, difficult to say. I'm convinced the predators are around the barn. There are, there are foxes, there are cats, there are owls. We do have all the predators that live around the barn and we see them if we put up camera traps we get nice pictures of foxes cats waiting for mice coming out and they learn also places where the mice might come out and are in reach of a mice if they don't come under the roof but there are a couple of holes or places where they can get out so there is selection actually for the mice to stay inside the barn um, so it's probably a mixture between food inside the barn and predators outside that um, lead to that selection pressure to try to stay in the barn and uh, reproduce there, even if you can't reproduce solitarily. There probably is this kind of selection pressure. Um, but I think that's quite normal for house mice because they live with humans. They don't live in a homogeneous habitat that's very heterogeneous. They live in barns, at least in Middle Europe. So, and when they disperse, we don't know, we know very little about dispersal. We do not know about their probability to breed at another place. We do not know that at all. But um, that they, when they disperse, they have to actually find another kind of barn or uh, uh, riding horse, place or whatever where food is because they literally sit on food. I think mice, and we observe that, they don't compete over food. You see them feeding on the feeding dishes, 20 mice sitting next to each other. They quabble a little bit, but they don't fight over food. So this is, means they are, don't fight over access to food. They fight over nest boxes or safe places to rear litters. But food, food is not the principally limiting resource 
once a population is established. So with this um, population outbreaks, I think that's a consequence then. There is enough food. Principally, they are not limited in food. They're more socially limited. And cooperation then allows them to increase population size, uh, which other species seem not to be able to do. And um, unfortunately, I had to retire. I mean, to be honest, I, I would have loved to continue and just see when do they start? I mean, we, we had over a thousand mice at some stages on, on, in the barn of 78 square meters. I mean, it's quite amazing. I mean, the average, I mean, different, we started with, I have forgotten, I think two mice per square meter. We had normal measures, which also is published in some other studies of 10 mice per square meters. We considered that as well rather high. But then, you know, it grew up to that, and I would have loved to see. But on the other hand, I think we would not have been able to manage that population anymore by just collecting data on that. Yeah. I would have loved to. Yeah. But uh, I don't know. Yeah. Thanks, Marin. So I have a question. Um, I know you said you, won't, you, didn't, you won't, didn't present data on this because you were just focusing on the males, but I am curious to know what the males are doing in the population. Are they resident or are they roaming around? Um, what's the story with the males? Good. First of all, obviously, I was so much overwhelmed by just the data on the females that I haven't had enough time. Uh, so if there's anybody in the audience who would be interested in males, please contact me. The data are there. What we know about the males is simply they live totally different social lives than the females. It's just, a, I mean, if you look at them, it's totally different uh, social life. They, the breeding males, this we know already, those that sire offspring at the moment more often sit alone in a nest box. They don't overlap with other individuals. They spend less time in nest boxes. They're probably busy all the time patrolling, marking, trying to access females. We do see that sometimes several males team up and move in the barn to take or then settle in an area where a male died, for example, or disappeared for whatever reason. We see that. So there might be even alliances among males um, that actually then try to access areas where several females live. We do have female groups, at least at lower densities. We had females groups that were not overlapped by a male, but nevertheless, the females move around and they mate with males. And I think there's no reason why males would not say welcome if a female in estrus comes along, but they might sit, smaller groups might sit in two nest boxes, but there's no male overlapping it. So males seem not to need a Oh, um, let's say a, a spatial overlap to be able to mate with a female because we don't know what they're doing when they're out of the nest boxes, at least not in detail. Yeah. So, but otherwise, you know, um, what male makes specific males very competitive. The best male we ever had in terms of reproductive success sired 105 offspring. And I compared it to 38 offspring weaned by a, by a female. So they can have a huge reproductive success. The successful men, males can be extremely successful, but half of them never sire surviving offspring. But we know not enough about male reproductive, whether they have alternative strategies. I would not be surprised to see that. Yeah. Sorry, yes. Lani, I cannot answer <laughs> more than. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. I guess you got to advertise a position for. for sure, yeah, they, data they are there. Data are there, so they can be analyzed. Yeah. yeah. Okay, um, Zulema. Yeah, I remember the question. The other question I had, um, it, I, if I understood it correctly, in the lab. You can only have two females nesting communally, but I'm you can wondering... have three. You can have three. three. That's all okay. we tried. That's all we tried. Yeah. Okay. Now, in the field, how large mm. can nesting groups get? And and one of the things that 
this triggered in my mind is that in, in some communal birds, at least, um, communally nesting birds, the first female will go in and lay her eggs. The second female will come in, dump some of the eggs out, which is sort of, you know, obviously it's like infanticide in your case. But then you can have a third female who comes in, also dumps eggs out. And let's say there's a fourth female, that female dumps eggs out, but nobody dumps theirs. So obviously the best, uh, the, the female that is in the best spot is the one that, that waits to be the last one in the group because none of her eggs are going to be destroyed. And I'm wondering, you know, how big, as I said, the groups get in the wild and whether you see, you see any, sim, any similarities or, or uh, convergences in what I just described in, in some of the communal, communally breeding birds and your mice. Mm -hmm. Genetically, as far as I remember, I think the communal nest with the largest number of contributing mothers was something of six, as far as I remember, six or seven. So there might oh. be many. On average, it's two, 2.1 or something like that. So on average, you just have two, but it can happen, as you said, that you get this kind of, we call it a little bit this loop, looping, you know, that more and more add to it. And what you described, uh, these are the, as far as I know, the roof built Arnie's data. I think that's perfectly mm -hmm. equivalent to what's going yeah. on. In Cosmos. We always compare them. We feel that's the equivalent in the world, in the world of the birds to what the house mice are doing. Of course, it's a bit of a difference whether you lay eggs or whether you lactate, but in principle, it's very similar. Yeah. There are a bit of, yeah. of course, because the males also contribute more in the birds than they do in house mice, maybe, Another answer to Lindelani is we do not have any indication that males do any parental care in the barn. In the lab, if you just have one male and one female, then the males also look after the pups. They, they can potentially paternally care for pups, but in the barn, I, we never had any indication that this happens. Probably because never population density was so low that we just have one male and one female. That might be the answer. But your question is perfectly right. I always consider the goose-billed armies as the equivalent. And the Ropalidia wasps might be the equivalent in the social <laughs> insects. I think it's not so special or, you know, you, you modify life history a little bit by the way of how you breed and 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 life expectancy or so, but I think in principle it's it's not unique. Yeah, I agree. I fully agree. Yeah, thanks. No, and, I, and I think actually, the whole thing. Right, I have forgotten to yes. say in the lab. Okay. Actually, it's always. I mean, if you init, if you have these three or so, it's always the last one, as you said, that's the best one, and that's the interesting yeah. thing that in the barn where they have more options available, we find that in the end they are more egalitarian they avoid exploiting another one which is quite interesting yeah yeah yeah, yeah. well thanks i mean i you know uh, i thought about the connection and just wanted to know what you thought because it seems so obvious yeah to me um but and i also i mean six females in one nest is like incredible in terms incredible. of the numbers yeah. it's interesting yeah. that, that happened mm -hmm. yeah thank you again sure Okay, thanks, Elena. Um, Maren? Um, yeah, um, I, that, that's just a curiosity question. Um, most mice, you said, are just about, get only about 100 days old. There was, I think, one that was nearly three years old. Do the mice drop dead in the barn or are they killed somewhere outside? Um, when they leave the barn and disappear, we don't know. Yeah. So when we... So we do both. We just analyze, you know, the time in the barn, average time in the barn. On the other hand, we regularly and carefully check for corpses. Also, if you find corpses of pups or sub-adults, we try to do genetics to see to whom they belong. And we use data only from animals that we find dead to calculate you know, life expectancies, you know, in the barn. That's all we can do. When they go out, we don't know. Um, you sometimes find mice. They're just dead laying around. 
Most of the time, actually, they have wounds, and this means they suffered from some kind of um, aggression. Um, we also do have diseases coming in and through. They do have parasites, so some certainly die. We have very limited information on that, but occasionally people from vet departments joined and looked at some some of the parasites they have, or we once had a um, zoonosis going through, and then they you analyze the cause of death. So from those that are found dead, from most of them, we don't know whether they died from, let's say, intraspecific aggression uh, or from diseases. In males, it's pretty obvious. I showed that picture of this increase in wounds with increasing breeding uh, activity. And we do have males where half of more than half of the body is just rather an open wound. They still run around and may live for a couple of months. And I always tell students, look, it's not actually a long life that's important, but it's your reproductive success that's important. And if they are, and they seem not to suffer, so to speak. I mean, they, they somehow, I mean, if you can breed and if you're successful in, in getting access to females, yeah, you don't care about these wounds. And then, but eventually, of course, we find them at some stage dead. And whether they then had an infection or we just don't know. Yeah. But we have most of the younger corpses of, corpses of pups or subadults. When we find those, I would say over 90% have wounds, have their skull opened or bite wounds in the neck, which indicate they have been killed by conspecifics. So mice are pretty nasty, yeah. And the females are specifically nasty. <laughs> so killing pups or sub-adults from neighboring groups. We sometimes you could see them somehow hunting, sitting on these structures. And if a young mouse in a neighboring group, if you know approximately where the social groups live, and if a young mouse came, they really jump on them and hunt for them. I mean, it's, it's quite, quite impressive. Yeah. <laughs> they try to get rid of competitors as soon as they can, or competitors for their offspring as soon as they can. Thank you very much. To be honest, it would be too expensive if you send all the corpses to our vet department and let them analyze them. <laughs> we, we, I wouldn't be able. And I think in most cases, they wouldn't be able to find out. Because the diseases, I mean, with the zoonosis, which I mentioned that or which I now mentioned that went through the population, um, we were really lucky that they that uh, people found out what it was. Because at first they just said, we don't know and, and how this goes. Because they have little experience with free-ranging house mice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you, Marvin. And thank you, Barbara, for such a wonderful talk. And to everyone for an engaging um, um, question session. Um, it's been very very nice to hear all the different talk questions that were coming up and yeah thanks thanks a lot Barbara so before everyone disappears I just have to again share my screen to remind everyone of the um the talk for next week which will be by um Lauren Brent and she will be talking about the benefits of social connections so this will be next week um yeah so thanks a lot everyone